All right, folks, today we're going to look at the difference between short-run costs and long-run costs, uh, and that's going to be in your textbook, pages 319 to 324, and we're going to look at the difference between short and long-run. We'll talk about a concept known as returns to scale, and we'll talk about what sunk costs are. So just as a reminder, what is the long run? Well, the long run is where all of your inputs and costs are variable, whereas in the short run, um, at least one of your inputs uh, is fixed. So in the short run, you can't make some changes. In the long run, you can make as many changes um, as you would like. So you know, if you want to open up a new store or close a plant or open up a new venue or something like that, in the long run, uh, you can do that. But in the short run, um, maybe you, you've got a, a lease that's fixed or something like that, and so there's nothing you can do until that lease is up, um, and then in which case you're in the short run. Uh, because inputs are variable in the long run, and we can make any change that we want and have any combination of inputs uh, that we want, we can then uh, begin to look at different cost curves in order to determine what the, the best mix of inputs is to reduce our average total costs given the amount of uh, goods that we might want to produce. Uh, so we might have a case like in this graph where um, maybe we have a choice between one machine or two machines. And so the first cost curve uh, shows us what our cost would look like, average total cost would look like if I had one machine, whereas uh, the other curve looks if I had two machines to make salsa. And uh, what we see is that if our production is less than four cases of salsa, then it would make sense to have only one machine because our average total costs are lower in this range. But if we're going to make uh, more than four cases of salsa, we would probably want to go with two machines because at that point, the average total cost for two machines is lower than for our one machine. Or we could look at a different example and say, um, maybe there's a, uh, a lemonade stand and uh, there are two employees and they're trying to decide whether to buy another juicer or not to make more uh, lemonade. And if they only have one juicer, then we can see their average total costs uh, in this column. And then if they're trying to decide to buy a second juicer, we could see uh, what their average total cost would be if they had the second juicer. Now, their fixed cost increased because they have to rent the machine, say, and their variable costs may actually go down because it takes fewer hours uh, for them to be able to make the same number of uh, amount of lemonade, uh, so maybe they don't have to work quite as much. So we see that there are definitely changes in the average total cost curve, and if we're trying to decide whether or not to purchase the second juicer or not, we'd have to ask how many cups we plan to produce, because if we still only plan to produce eight cups per hour, um, then it would make sense to stick with one juicer because the average total cost here of $9.38 is less than the average total cost if I have two juicers, which is $14.06. Um, and in fact, I'll continue to stay with one juicer until my production level is greater than 32 cups per hour because at that point, at 32 cups per hour, the average total cost with one juicer is exactly the same as uh, two juicers, now I'm basically indifferent. But if I plan to make 33 cups or more, the average total cost begins to go down um, if I buy a second juicer. So I'll continue to expand uh, production, um, or I'll, I'll buy more juicers, I should say, when my production reaches uh, 32 cups or more. And that's really what we need to know is, uh, in order to make a determination in the long run as to what the combination of inputs is, is what is my uh, expected output. If my expected output is greater than my uh, current output, that will change, uh, potentially change, the, uh, the input combination that I choose. Because my goal is to lower the average total cost of production um, in the long run. In order to lower my average total cost in the long run, I need a long run average total cost curve. And essentially what it is, is um, a U-shaped cost curve that is made up of the minimum cost point among all of the various potential average total cost curves given the different combination of inputs that I can choose. So uh, in this case, maybe I'm making salsa again, and uh, ATC3 is my average total cost curve if I have uh, three machines, and maybe ATC6 is going to be my cost curve if I have six machines. And ATC9 is my average total cost curve if I have nine machines. And the minimum points of each 
kind of our tangent to the long run average total cost curve and begin to form this kind of U shape. And then we can just look and see where um, where our proper combination of inputs is based on what my expected level um, of output would be. If I expect output to be three cases of salsa, then clearly I want three machines because at that point, average total cost for three machines is at point A. If I had six machines, I'd be up here at point B with a much higher average total cost. So if I have three cases that I expect to sell, then I'll have three machines. But if I change and I say I expect to, to make uh, six cases, then um, I'll go with six machines because at that point the uh, ATC6 is the minimum uh, average total cost because if I have only three machines then average cost is way up here and if I have nine machines the cost is also um, extremely high as an average total cost. And so in order to decide what the proper combination is again we look at our different average total cost curves and find which one um, brings us the lowest average total cost given the level of production that we're expecting. The shape of the long run average total cost curve also tells us something about uh, production. We see that if the average total cost curve in the long run begins to decline across uh, output levels, then we refer to the uh, input or the production as having increasing returns to scale. Essentially, um, I become more efficient and it costs me less on average as I increase my production. And so that's called increasing returns to scale. And then as it begins to go back up, as average total cost rises with increased production, we say that we've reached a point of decreasing returns to scale. And if uh, there is no change in average total cost, then we're talking about an area where there are constant returns to scale. And so there are points at which increasing production lowers your average total costs and makes uh, sense for efficiency. And there'll be points at which um, we'll begin to lose that benefit of efficiency, maybe because my, my plant is so large that it's difficult to coordinate work among uh, the various different departments in the manufacture of a, of a product of some sort. Um, maybe the, the coordination of the machinery is, is just asking for too much, in which case uh, my average total cost will begin to rise. But again, if I expect there to be nine cases of salsa sold, even though I'm experiencing decreasing returns to scale, I'm still going to buy nine machines because it does lower uh, and minimize my average total cost. So increasing returns to scale are caused by things like the uh, in improvement in specialization as people become more uh, productive as they specialize in jobs and they just get really, really good at what they're doing and so they're able to produce more at a lower cost because uh, of, of uh, gains in productivity and efficiency or, or maybe there's just high setup costs um, to begin with and, uh, and so it creates uh, efficiencies and as we increase uh, production it begins to, to lower the, the overall average total cost but we lose returns to scale because of things like coordination and communication. As, as organizations get larger, bureaucracies get larger, uh, it becomes more difficult to, to coordinate and, and take advantage of the gains of efficiencies. And so we may see average total costs actually begin to rise. The last curve I want to mention, or, or cost I want to mention, is this idea of sunk costs. This is something that trips people up. Um, basically, sunk costs are costs that you have already incurred, the money is spent, and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. And so those costs should have no bearing on your decisions in the future as to whether or not to spend money uh, or not. So one, once you've spent it, there's nothing you can do about it. So if you join a summer swim club and you buy the membership up front and then you never visit the pool again and they say, oh, it's September and, and there's one day left and it's really cold, but I got to go to the pool, otherwise I won't have got my money's worth. Uh, economically speaking, that's kind of a foolish decision because the money is already spent. You can't get it back. It's, it's uh, gone forever. And so whether you take advantage of the membership or not on that last day is irrelevant because you've already spent the money. And so uh, sunk costs are, are something that you should kind of keep in mind, especially in production. Um, there's nothing you can do to get them back, and the best thing you can do is avoid spending it in the first place so that you don't have to regret it. Um, another example might be if you walk into a theater and the movie is really bad, but you paid $6 or $10 for the ticket, 
it doesn't make sense to stay and continue to watch a bad movie just to get your $10 worth because the movie's really awful. You're never going to get your $10 worth, and there's nothing to do anyway because the money is spent. So uh, keep that idea in mind, and we'll talk more about sunk costs and long-run costs when you get into class, and I'll see you then.